Have you ever seen The Matrix? This is a movie that's about a guy named Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, who he's a programmer and he lives a pretty average, kind of boring life. And one day, he's a he's awoken from the Matrix in a way that's kind of interesting. In a way that he his interest is piqued by a different message he's never seen before that makes him think that there might be more to this world. And he comes to realize that he's actually living in a simulation. Uh, he's actually enslaved by AI robotic overlords. And he eventually gets pulled out of the Matrix and realizes his full potential. Now, virtual machines aren't that deep, but they can help you reach your full potential in IT. And they're, in many ways, similar to the Matrix in that they're like a system inside of another system. A matter of fact, they are a computer inside of another computer. Uh, let me explain. So, what, you, what I have here behind me is a tool called VMware. And VMware, or VMware Workstation Player, to be more specific. VMware Workstation Player is what's called a Type 2 hypervisor because it is installed in an operating system already. So um, I've already got Windows 11 installed on this computer that I'm making this video on. And inside of Windows 10 is uh, VMware uh, as an application installed. Now, there are also type 1 hypervisors that are the operating system, meaning, for example, one is called VMware ESXi. You can Google that and look it up. You know, I have servers that run VMware ESXi at my lab. And that's the operating system. And the main purpose of that type of operating system to, is to manage other virtual machines and virtual operating systems. With a type 2 hypervisor, it's just convenient for if you already have a desktop OS. And there's all kinds of them. I recommend you check them out. There's VirtualBox. There's VMware. There's XCPNG. There's QEMU. There's so many that you can go look out there. Look at a list of them. The, one of the most popular, though, is VMware. And VMware Workstation Player, the one I've got on screen right here, that's free. You can go download that for free. VirgilBox is also free. Use either of those. Um, if you're on Mac or Linux, I, I believe you should use VirtualBox. Um, I think on Mac, the, there's not a free VMware, but correct me if I'm wrong on that. Tell me in the chat or the comments. What I'm going to show you today and why I even talked about the Matrix and virtual machines is because... Within the context of cybersecurity and ethical hacking, you're really going to want to get familiar with using VMs because they help you experiment, play around, and you know every machine for the most part on Hack the Box is a virtual machine, that or a Docker container, and these are systems that can be created and are in a sense infinite, infinitely scalable or scalable within the confines of the hardware they're running on. But VMs make it much easier to migrate and move systems from one hardware to the other and to also scale them up. So I'm in this video, I want to show you how you can use v, uh, your own VM to set up a hacking workstation to connect to hack the box and to hit targets on Hack the Box. This is different from what we did in the last video where we had Pwnbox, which is Parrot OS in the browser, still a VM, but maintained and set up by the Hack the Box team. This is going to be maintained and set up by you. I'll show you how to initially set that up um, right now. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to select your hacking distribution, right? So what are you what operating system are you going to install essentially? And 
I recommend Parrot OS. It's relatively new. It's a project that's collaborating with Hack the Box, and you know, obviously, you see with Pwnbox, it, it runs Parrot. I do have to honorable mention Kali Linux, which is a very popular distribution, a hacking or penetration testing distribution. And when you hear the term penetration testing distribution, that's really a distribution that has a bunch of security tools that are known and curated by industry practitioners, security practitioners and developers who, you know, are using these very popular tools. I don't get tribal about this. I really feel like whatever OS you choose is a preference. Um, I am familiar with security professionals that don't use Kali or Parrot or anything well known. They'll use Ubuntu and they will set up their own hacking distribution or their own security distribution. You know, at some point you start to realize, you know, that it's really nice that they're setting this up. I like the UI. It looks beautiful. But you start to realize you could set up a base version of any Linux distro and you could just clone repos of tools into your distro and have your own hacking OS, essentially. But I do like Kali and I do like uh, Parrot OS. I, I use Parrot OS. I like the look. I've met people on that team, and I think they're awesome people, and I just like it, right? Um, I am not going to force that on anybody, though, and I want to be honest about it and educate everyone, especially beginners, and just know, you know, this is nice to have it. It's nice setup, and the menus are great, but you can, over time, you also want to think about how you can set up, you know, like an Ubuntu distro and get your tools on there that you need, right? or any Linux distro and set up your security tools on there, right? I mean, there are Windows hacking distros. There's a, um, it's really not a distro, but it's like a script you can run that outfits a Windows image with all, like, offensive tools. Commando VM, Mandiant made it. It's really cool. If you've never messed with Commando, I really recommend it because... Just to be honest, just watching that script work was is just amazing. You know, you run it and you can have Windows 10 just set up, base Windows 10, run that script, and it just automatically sets up, downloads all the tools. It, it'll take a while. It took a couple hours the last time I tried it, and I set up a Windows 10 VM because I wanted to see what it did. Changes the desktop background. It, adds all these tools and directories and you know then you can start doing attacks from windows so that would be an interesting way to uh approach boxes on hack the box right all that to say when you're going to be working in hack the box i will recommend for beginners start with parrot os or cali uh, experiment with both just so you know and so you can you can develop your own opinion be careful in the world of Linux because it gets very dogmatic. I mean, when I, I, I'm hesitant when I step into talking about Linux and even teaching it because there are so many amazing and incredible minds in the industry, some of which are very, very territorial and tribal about their distro. And if you say the wrong thing, you might say the wrong text editor, it's war, right? It's, look, no, Vim, no, Nano, no, blah, blah, blah. No, you know, so the, it gets real competitive and sometimes dogmatic. I, I just want to encourage you in all that dogma to just develop your own opinion. Try not to have your own opinion before you've even tried it, right? So you might hear what somebody says and you just all of a sudden start to hate it because the, someone else hates it. You should try it for yourself. So all that said... Let's do this. So I'm not going to download the image in the video because you would be very bored watching a file download. So what you're going to do is go get your distro right now. Pick Parrot or Kali. Download it. 
wait for it to be done downloading go out get if you don't already have it get vmware virtualbox or even in windows you could you could use the built-in hypervisor as hyper v um, you could check for that uh, feature and see if it's enabled you could enable it either way get your os you're going to use and get the image and get the hypervisor once you have that image open up your hypervisor i'm doing vmware if you want this to be step by step you should probably use vmware as well because that's what i'm using and we're going to set up a vm from scratch don't feel bad if you've never done this right you can't know everything this is a great process to learn and it's such cool technology i'm still wowed by it to this day and i've known about it for over 10 years you're going to want to create a new virtual machine and then you're going to select installer disk image or ISO file. Browse for it. You're going to find it on probably in your downloads folder or, you know, wherever your browser is putting images that get downloaded. I keep a directory on my computer called ISOs. I'll show you right here. It's at the root of C. You can maybe put it on a flash drive, whatever. This is where I keep my ISOs. I recommend you become just an ISO collector, right? When your friends come over to your house, you're just like, look at all my ISOs. I've got the greatest ISOs ever. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, don't do all that. But co collect ISOs because they, you never know when you're going to need them. I have a flash drive around here. It's an external solid state drive. Keep it in my book bag. There's tons of ISOs in there, gigs and gigs of ISOs that could be, could be used you know, in any situation, you know, Windows Server, Windows 10, Windows 11, Windows 7, you know, VMware ESXi, Parrot, Kali. I got a bunch of ISOs. You never know when you're going to need ISOs. Just know that. What we're going to do is we're going to pick our Parrot OS system, double click that. You'll notice in the new virtual machine wizard, it says I uh, could not detect the operating system. We're going to hit next. It is Debian. It's a, it's a flavor of Debian, uh, pair it is. Hit next, obviously you want Linux to be checked. Next, we're gonna call this, you know, Parrot OS. You could call this what you want. You know, if you wanna give it some cool theme, I'm just gonna call it Parrot OS. <laughs> How original. And do next. Now this is gonna really be dependent on what you're going to use this thing for. So are you going to store a lot of stuff in here? Are you planning on over time, like every tool you're hearing about, leaving it on there? Um, because this is, right now, this is just an example that I'm doing. I'm probably going to just leave this at 20 gigs and go forward. But 20 gigs these days, that's not a lot. You know, that's, that's, that's going to be hogged up quick. So over time, you'll want to be mindful of this. And you can expand disk capacity in, in VMs uh, dynamically. But just know, I really recommend, you know, you think about it now. How much do you need right now? You know, and how much do you have available to allocate to the VM? So next. Next, and, and you know, of course, you can do this on a flash drive too, or I would recommend an external SSD drive. One thing you can also do, and you'll notice what I just did, Parrot OS, I hit edit virtual machine settings so I could choose more. Look, one processor is very slow, and this is going to depend on how many cores your processor has or processors have, and you're going to want to pick, you know, at least four in my opinion. Four or more. And um, memory, two gigs is preposterous. That's not enough, right? Not enough to run even Chrome these days. Chrome, it's like an OS in itself. So, you know, at least four, at least four, which is 4,096 megs. Um, but I'm going to drag it up to four gigs. And then... You're going to look at the rest of these and you just want to, you know, kind of make note of it. So I'll hit OK, make sure the changes are there. I do want to briefly mention this, and, and this is not a virtualization class per se. Maybe I should do a series on that. But 
Um, virtual networking is fascinating. And before you can really wrap your head around that, I do think you need to know how traditional networking works. Just because Nat and those terms will be like, whoa, that doesn't make sense in a virtual sense. But just know for now, your network adapter defaults to what's called Nat mode, which means there's some IP address translation that happens between the IP address on your VM and the IP address on your actual computer that's running this VM. So this VM will have internet access through the PC. In my example, for, for my home, my computer I'm on now, this VM will have an IP and it will translate through VM. VMware will be sort of like the virtual router for the VMware computers. It will do NAT on the adapter of my my uh, my actual PC, which is running Windows 11. And then it'll go out to the internet and that will happen again on the actual like router that's on my network. So you can do other really cool stuff on here too. Like you, we could customize all this. We could bridge this. We could create their, like their own little NAT virtual networks. Meaning I could have, I could create a network and just call it, I don't know, uh, you know, virtual learning network and it's a it's a vmware virtual network and i could have multiple vms i set up on that network and it's on its own ip scheme and it has internet connectivity and so it's really kind of cool what you can do in vmware and it gets even more complex when you start looking at like enterprise stuff like vmware and vsphere uh, vmware vsphere and all that and vcenter and that stuff's really cool. But for now, don't worry about that since we're just setting up a VM. So hit OK. We're going to power this thing up and see if we did everything right. Hit OK. Boom, try slash install. One thing about Linux distros that is really cool, most of them can do what's called live boot meaning all of the things required to run the operating system get loaded into RAM. And um, that results in you being able to run this without, um, without it being actually installed to a hard drive. And uh, that's kind of cool because that means you could put a hacking distro on a flash drive plug it into a computer, boot off that flash drive live, and run the OS on the system. The challenge with that and the awareness you need to have of that as a defender is uh, if you're administering a network environment of computers, you know, physical computers and hardware, you may want to lock down booting off of flash drives or at least, you know, having the boot you may want to restrict at, you put a password on uefi or on the bios and turn off the the boot option of the flash drive and i'm saying this because um because what someone can do is they can load linux a live distro of linux and they can actually plug in and when they boot off of that linux distro it will actually allow them to access the underlying file system of whatever systems already on the hard drive. So that means if it's like Windows, you could get into the file system and that's where the files are, right? I mean, the data is, is right there. So I've done that before, I've seen that work. Just plug it in, boot off the flash drive. Uh, you see NTFS right there, double click, boom, you drill down and you get what you want you can get the sam database you can get you can get a lot you can get uh you know anything that doesn't need to be essentially loaded when when windows boots up which is there's a lot of th there's a lot of uh juicy things that windows just stores without needing the os to run and that's a great point somebody mentioned during the making of this video about hard drive encryption and you do hope that your drive's encrypted so that isn't, isn't a factor that prevents 
the data from being accessed um, without the system being loaded. This is Parrot. This is in RAM. But I, I personally, like, you know, I'm thinking I want to use this. So I am going to install Parrot. If you don't want to use Palmbox, you can you can go to different cloud, you know, desktop as a service sites, and set up Cali. Uh, what is it? Digital Ocean is one of them. Um, you know, there's a ton of them. There's one I learned about Chasm, K A S M. That one's kind of cool. cool. Very fast. I'm nexting through all this. I'm nexting to the Promised Land. And you see how I'm doing a race disc? When I do a race disc, what uh I'm not erasing the hard drive. I'm erasing the virtual hard disk file that was created by VMware. How do I know? Because it says there's only 20 gigs available. Do you remember when we were first setting this VM up before we even had the OS loaded? It was it let us pick how much hard drive space. We picked 20. Right now, that is a allocation of the actual hard drive, but or solid state drive, but this allocation of it is v managed by VMware, and there's only 20 gigs, so it's a virtual hard disk that you're erasing here. So don't worry that you're going to blow your system away. So hit next, and I'm just going to do my nickname, LTN Bob is my name. I'll use LTN Bob. This computer will be the matrix. As corny as that is, but we just said it earlier. So, you don't have to know what that is, but make sure you pick your own. Next, install. Yep, install now. And it's going to start the process of installing Parrot OS. And this can take some time. All right, so now that we have our VM set up, it's in Parrot's installed, or whatever OS you decided to use is installed, we can go ahead and get logged in. And I'm going to show you how you can connect to Hack the Box's VPN using your VPN key. And keep in mind that this is the alternative to using Pwnbox, which is the browser based VM. So I'm just log in. And we'll get our nice GUI. And I always like the backgrounds that uh, the Parrot team got going. They're artsy and it's a Parrot, right? Let's open up Firefox. And we can go out to Hack the Box's website. You know, you, you might be new to Linux. This might be your first time that you've ever worked inside of Linux maybe you've heard of it I don't know maybe you've taken a class on it and it became it's just something that's intimidating and I, th I feel like a lot of people are initially especially beginners are initially intimidated by Linux and I'm here to tell you it's really not that intimidating nothing is if you just try it out right when we're talking about you know learning th new things and, you know, Parrot OS is, is really just like any other OS. If you've ever used Windows or Mac OS, and by the way, Mac OS is closely related to a lot of Linux distros, and it's very it's going to be very familiar to you, right? All the same concepts, for the most part, of an OS are there. You know, the first thing I do when I start up my Windows computer normally after I log in or once I log in is I open up the web browser and I start browsing the web, right? We live in a world where web applications are the dominant, you know, way to to interact now on the internet. Let's go ahead and head to Hack the Box and I want you to download your VPN key. So I'm gonna log in here. All right, and once you get logged in, you know what Hack the Box looks like at this point in the video series, but you're going to do something a little different from what we've done so far. 
you're going to instead of when you connect when you click connect to HDB instead of um, instead of clicking pwn box you're going to click open VPN we're gonna go starting point and click open VPN notice you've got UDP and you've got TCP let me move my face out of the way what's the difference between UDP and TCP UDP is faster TCP is more reliable right we're gonna download the VPN leave it default this is going to download a VPN key so VPN file and I'll put that in documents for now hit save and we're going to need to run that file using a tool called OpenVPN, which is already in Parrot OS, which is one of the benefits of already using like a pre built version of Linux, a hacking distro. Uh, I believe OpenVPN is also in Kali, very popular VPN tool. The way we're going to run this. And there's lots of ways you can do this. You don't need to do it the way I'm about to show you. If you're on a Mac, you can use a bunch of different VPN clients. You've just got to import this file into there and turn it on, which basically runs the VPN and forms the tunnel. I do not personally recommend that you download a VPN key for Hack the Box and run that and establish that tunnel from a personal computer that you're using for you know work or for you know your day-to-day -day stuff I would say again get a dedicated VM you know this is for hacking on hack the box and you know or use Pwnbox and that's another benefit that I really like with of Pwnbox is that when you terminate that Pwnbox whatever was on there is gone which is a benefit in and of itself, right? The reason I say that is, while it may not be that common, once you start doing more advanced stuff on Hack the Box's environments, I do need you to understand that you are in a you're in an environment that other people are also in, attacking machines and stuff like that. Now, yes, Hack the Box has security controls in place to prevent players from hacking other players. It can happen, right? You know, especially when you start listeners on the network, when you start creating web servers on your hacking machine so you can transfer files to and from them. When you open up a machine like that, you know, it can get hacked, right? Just like the vulnerable machines we're, we're looking to attack. So when you think about your operational security as, as an ethical hacker, which is also referred to as OPSEC, with operational security you really do want to be mindful of where you're connecting to and how you're proceeding you know um, just know that when you connect to these network environments there's other people on them is it going to be common that others would attack you know probably not but is it possible from a technical standpoint if you think about the risk you're that's the risk to the system you're on currently right so if I was like using my Windows machine where there's personal stuff on there or my, you know, my wife's computer and there's personal and I've got my hack the box VPN and I'm just starting Python web servers in any directory or any folder on the machine with personal info that's in that folder too, you know, stuff could get downloaded because when you do, there's commands you're going to run in some of these challenges coming up where you may run you know, a Python, and you just spin up an, an HTTP server, which starts serving the files in the directory you're in up through a web server, meaning if the person knows, you know, the IP and the port that you're, you're hosting that quick web server on, they could try to, you know, download files from it and connect to it. They could go to the browser, type in that, your IP, your, your Pwnbox IP on the VPN, and it might show them, you know, the full, the what's in the contents of the directory you're serving up if you're if you're doing it that way. So, you know, there are things to be aware of 
And this is true in the industry as well. So if you're on a pen test and you're, you know, there's defenders on the other end, they may try to hack back, right? You know, they may try to see, oh, wow, this person's not thinking about operational security. They started a Python web server in a directory that their report, that their in-progress report is in, and they download your pen test report. You know, it's like, okay, well, look, you're, we found the pen tester's report that they were working on. You know, it's like, you know, will that, ha- has ha- can that happen? Yes, has that happened? Yes, that's happened to people. So, they, you know, look at look those things up, operational security mistakes. And, and just considerations. It's kind of a blind spot when you think about it. Because if, you know, you're doing some hacking, you're like, well, I'm the only one that knows this stuff. But that's not true, right? Starting point, VPN file, right? Uh, we're going to open terminal to get to that. And I, I remember I put in documents before I went on my rant. When you're in Linux, again, I recommend you ls becomes your best friend. ls is the best command, in my opinion. Fight me about it. Fight me if you don't agree. Fight me in the comments. So ls because it tells me where I'm at. PWD also tells me where I'm at. Print working directory. And we're going to find ourselves CDing or changing directories to documents. And I'm going to do ls. And starting point is in there. I'm going to type clear. And I'm going to do sudo open VPN and tab. Tab just auto completes. I hit enter and I'm typing my password and it's going to now connect me v- to uh, the hack the box VPN. Now you want to make sure the initialization sequence completes. I'm not going to go through every single log in, in this process of establishing the tunnel, but what I do want you to know what happened was you connected to one of hack the boxes open VPN servers. And it created a VPN tunnel, uh, which created, and we talked about this in the last video, it created a, let me zoom this in, it created a tunnel interface. So if you do IP add, you're going to see ton zero, and you'll see the IP on that network. And this is where, if we were going to be doing a starting point challenge, now we go over here to starting point and we did meow last fawn would be next it should detect that we're connected yeah so when I click that notice how it detected we have a connection and we could spawn the machine it spawn machine once that's up, we'll have our IP. We could test this, right? The main difference between between this and Pwnbox is this connection right here is coming directly from my network. It's in the VM that's on my local area network. So that tunnel got formed between this computer that's on my network and Hack the Box's VPN server. This is a system that I am officially pinging from my network over the internet well, through the VPN, which is going over the internet. That's another thing with poem boxes. You kind of got a peace of mind that it, you're on another network doing this. Do a ping the same way I would if I was in poem box. 10, 129, And I know it's up. I know I'm on that VPN and I, I have a connection. I can proceed with the challenge. And we will do that in the next video.